Well, thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Bill Leggett, and I'm a bookseller at Powell's Books. Before we begin, I wanted to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. One of the many great events we're looking forward to is David Sheff in conversation with Jarvis J. Masters and Rebecca Solnit, which takes place on Monday, August 10th. They'll discuss Chef's new book, The Buddhist on Death Row, How One Man Found Light in the Darkest Place. Please consider following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. As well, if you haven't already done so, please sign up for our weekly events email at powells.com. But today, we're honored to welcome Bonnie Toy in conversation with Chrissy Van Meter about Bonnie's new book, Why We Swim. Bonnie Choi is a longtime contributor to the New York Times and California Sunday Magazine. Her journalism has earned the Lowell Thomas Gold Award from the Society of American Travel Writers and a National Press Foundation Fellowship. Her last book, American Chinatown, A People's History of Five Neighborhoods, won the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature. And her book, Why We Swim, is a cultural and scientific exploration of humanity's relationship with the water and the act of swimming and is propelled by a series of stories, stories of Olympic champions, a Baghdad swim club that meets in Saddam Hussein's palace pool, and even an Icelandic fisherman who improbably survives a wintry six hour swim after a shipwreck. And Bonnie also relates her personal love of swimming and the transformative effect it has had on her life. And Bonnie is joined in conversation by Chrissy Van Meter, a writer, editor, teacher, surfer, and swimmer based in Los Angeles. She is the author of the novel Creatures, and her writing has appeared in Catapult, ESPN, The Hairpin, and Bustle, among others. She teaches creative writing at the Writing Institute at Sarah Lawrence College, is the founder of the literary project Five Quarterly, and is the managing editor of Novella Books. The evening's event will also include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question that you'd like to know the answer to as well, please consider voting that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. And most importantly, please consider supporting both Bonnie Choi and Powell's by purchasing a copy of the book, Why We Swim. A link to buy the book will be shared in the chat this evening. Bonnie, Christy, it's an honor to welcome you both today and thank you for joining us and have a wonderful event. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Yay, Chrissy. We get to hang out. Doing this. Um, everyone needs to know that um, Chrissy and I have had a, 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 a crush from afar for a long time, and, and we're really excited um, to, uh, to be in this conversation together, especially for me. I read Creatures um, in the fall and just loved it, loved it, loved uh -huh. it. I um, was really excited that we share yeah, a wonderful, amazing publisher, Algonquin, and um, we get to be together today. So. I know, and I, I was thinking, so I, I read your book, um, so I was like, what, on book tour and stuff, and roaming around right before we all got sort of shut down, and um, I read your book, I think, literally the first week I was, like, home, <laughs> like, panicking, and it was such a, like, it just like gave me this like really weird sense of purpose and like feeling like everything was going to be okay. And I think part of that was timing, but I also just think like, even this book is about swimming and it's gotten so many amazing reviews and you are talking to so many people about it. And, but like, even if you're not a swimmer, um, I think this book is so special because it's about sort of spirituality in a way and connecting to something and connecting to nature. And you know, I think whether you grew up on swim team or you swim in pools or you swim in the ocean or whatever, I think there's this, way to connect to this book in the sense of like even if you live in the mountains and you go to the ocean and you look at it or you're at a river even or just something about water is um you know so special to humans and this book really like dives into the whole human psyche of like water and connecting to earth and it's really special and I I just love it I it's so good thank you that's I mean what you just said was exactly what I wanted this book to do and to be. I wanted it to be um, expansive and feel, yeah. um, but feel that it could speak to specific experiences, but to a specific range, like a wide range of specific yeah. experiences. And um, I wanted it to speak to people who called themselves swimmers, but also to people who didn't. And, right. and underscore that we all had, we all have this really strange and singular relationship with the water. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there's a part in the book that I like screamed a little bit. Um, it was something that I spent for Creatures, which also has marine life. It's obviously fiction though, and not as cool as what you're doing here. I just made all my shit up. But um, you know, this um, idea that whales once sort of had legs and then went back into the ocean and you sort of talk about it too, like their inner ear. And it's like this crazy, you know, weird scientific explanation, but the evolution of, of people and things and creatures going in and out of the water and always sort of being drawn back to it, I think were like, is so interesting and like captured so well in what you're saying in terms of like literal nonfiction. But, but the way you did it was great with these, um, you know, it's so easy to, I think, explain animals in ocean or water, but, uh, but humans, you know, are interesting creatures. And I really want to know about, which I'm sure everyone asks you about that Icelandic fisherman who I will not say his name, but I've, I, I want you to explain to everyone what a little bit of that story that you wrote. And then I want to know what your relationship is now with them, because from what I'm hearing, maybe you're still friends with them. We are still friends. Um, this Icelandic fisherman, Gudlaugur Fridthorsson. So he, his is the story that opens the book, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there is a reason for that. It was a story that my husband told me over dinner one night. And, um, and I recount this in the beginning of the book because it was when I was kind of first thro throwing around the idea of yeah. writing a book about swimming. And he was just sort of like, oh, you know, I heard the story recently. And it was about this Icelandic fisherman, Gudlaugur Fridthorsen, who in 1984, um, his fishing vessel uh, capsized off the coast of Iceland um, one night in March. And, you know, it's very cold there. It's, it was 41 degree water. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. And every, so the boat goes over and everyone's thrown into the water and then they're all kind of holding onto the keel. And then one by one, you know, he, only he and the, um, the captain of the boat is left and they all said to each other, you know, they couldn't deploy the um, emergency raft. They couldn't grab, they couldn't release it. And so wow. one of the things that um, he said to me that I just will never forget was he's like, I, we talked to each other and we said, if there's anyone left to tell, we're going to tell what happened mm. because usually when things like this happen, yeah. he, no one's left to tell. And he's like, right. I had a responsibility to do that. So he swam six hours, um, in 41 degree water, six kilometers. Um, that's insane. You know, that's insane. And also yeah. like, he wasn't going straight right. know, towards, <laughs> um, <laughs> towards shore. So it was actually probably more than that, but he ended up that he followed the lighthouse of his Island. Um, and then not only did he swim that once he got out, you know, the, the, the topography of this Island is like super um, spiky lava, like two volcanoes on it. And so he had to, he first hit land on these like sheer 100 foot cliffs and he could get out. And so he had to like swim a little further and then crawl across this lava spike field and like um, punch through this like sheep cistern, like of frozen water to get, cause he was like super thirsty from being in salt water for like six hours. I can't and even then, imagine this. Um, it's amazing that, and then he finally sees these lights, you know, in town and, and knocks on the door and, and behind the trail, you know, is a trail of bloody footprints because it's like boots fell off. He's walking across this lava field and they get him to the hospital and he, um, they can't discern his heartbeat, his, uh, like, you know, he doesn't show any signs of de of um, uh, hypothermia at all. Yeah. He's only a little bit dehydrated. And they're like, what the? Yeah. I, I don't know how many kids are here, but what the F? <laughs> and like, they don't understand him. And, um, and it turns out that not only was he a very good swimmer, he had, um, this his, his his biological quirk was that his body fat was like two to three times normal human thickness and this is the thing that makes me think of your book chrissy is that he's like a selkie he has like like a seal you know yeah. just human seal and they call yeah. him that and um you know like this the selkie of like mythology of icelandic and like scottish mythology and yeah. just stories of like going to and from the sea and i think that's why he's such this mythological um, figure in Icelandic history and yeah. is such this iconic symbol of like um, survival resilience right so mm -hmm. they're, they're such a hardy people they survive in the most intense like darkest winter right. and coldest weather and yeah. lives lost at sea because of fishing and um, and he survived you know he was able to do that and he was able to come back and then tell the story and say like hey we have to make you know self-deploying life rafts uh, mandatory across the Icelandic fishing fleet and that yeah. was his mission to do that Wow. Yeah. And you're so, do you still talk with him? Yeah, I do. That's so crazy. I do. Um, what does he think about the book? But I mean, I'm sure, and you even say in the book, I mean, 
that story is so famous now and he's sort of like like a legend of among his own people and and i think elsewhere too um yeah. but like how does he feel about the book like, so he um the sort of backstory is that he became quite famous globally at that time and then um you know was very vocal about yeah telling a story and, and getting the things that he promised to get done done and was like in um, experiments and uh, to test human you know okay for hypothermia and learn more about the human body and he was just like he's a quiet guy he like private guy he's yeah. uh, really really funny and he's like a, a very strong <laughs> family and friend network but like you know he was tired of being like a guinea pig spotlight on him yeah so he became really um uh over after several years he became quite private and reclusive mm. and didn't talk to journalists anymore and so every once in a while his story would surface and then he would just be like no no i don't want to be a part of any of this and because he had talked to many journalists in the beginning um, right reason. and so i knew all this about him because when you google him like that's yeah. what you learn you learn about yeah. the story you learn about what happened and then you learn that he doesn't talk to people anymore and so me as a journalist i was sort of like uh very conflicted super mm -hmm. ambivalent like i would love to talk to this person right. i want to hear what he has to say about his experience and what is he you know 35 years later what is he how does he view something how does he mm -hmm. view, view this period of his life and then also knowing what i know like i don't want i want to respect his wishes and also sure. learn how he would frame that story so then i was trying to figure out how to how i could approach him and do that and so i ended up writing him a letter mm. and then i've told the story many times but i ran it through google translate mm -hmm. <laughs> into icelandic and then printed it up and like sent it to him uh and like i watched you know like the alerts like tell me that it was like going over the atlantic and then he got the letter i knew that he got the letter because i got the alert and then wow he writes me an email the thing is the email in the email he says i don't want to talk to you <laughs> yeah yeah and of course why would he um but then i wrote him back i was just something about the way he wrote back to me mm -hmm. saying i i don't actually want to talk to journalists it's not personal but this is why I, haven't, I don't feel that I've been treated very fairly and there was a movie made about me that was really against my wishes and mm. so I just was sort of like well maybe I'll just write back to that and see what happens yeah. and so we ended up writing wow. to each other for a year yeah and then we met in person I think it's so interesting too like obviously you know if I were to just read this book as just like straight nonfiction about swimming it's you know, so well reported. It's so interesting. But then you you do this sort of memoir -y thing where there's so much of you in this book too. And I want to know, com like, you know, from a writing point of view, from my own curiosity, like, did you sort of set out to do that? Or was that something that just kind of came organically? Because clearly this book is full of research. So there's that element. But then there is so much of you in this personal side of you. So yeah. was that intentional? Um... I did not really set out wanting to have so much of myself in the book. Mm -hmm. So the, I am uncomfortable with memoir because I just feel like I don't have, my story is not that interesting. I, I'm objectively like as a journalist saying this, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I'm like looking out and seeing the world and saying this person, this person, mm -hmm. all of these people have so many, so much more to say that's interesting they're you know I mean, what i mean by it is like the, the the narrative drama of their stories like they, it's just they have things that, that happened to them that were so um i mean i just so disagree with this but yeah <laughs> keep going <laughs> but you know so, so i um and i also knew that you know i i i like to be um i like to be in the frame like i understand that uh, yeah as a as a device to have a narrator who is accessible mm -hmm. and I can do that. I understand that I can mm -hmm. do that and I enjoy writing in that mode where I kind of like bring the reader into the story mm -hmm. because I'm a character in the that person, that bigger person's mm -hmm. story, like a supporting role. And so mm -hmm. I, I feel comfortable with that. Like I, I feel okay with that. And so I kind of set out to write it like that. Mm -hmm. And then of course, over time, there are little bits that, um, you know, my editor, my wonderful editor, Amy Gash, would be like, I wouldn't know what you mm -hmm. felt about that. Or mm -hmm. you could actually come forward into the foreground a little bit more and 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 make it even more poignant. You can mm -hmm. deepen this story. And so I began to little by little feel comfortable with that. And so 
I, I actually really, um, you know, it's an interesting hybrid of a book because it is uh, reportage and, um, mm -hmm. and other people's great narrative stories, but also that I am in there as mm -hmm. a frame. And so I actually got more comfortable over time with it. And I, you know, I've done that in smaller pieces, right? Essay, mm -hmm. like that, that I think are more just overtly mm -hmm. essayistic. Mm -hmm. and personal essay but like in a book i feel like i i haven't written that many books so i don't really right i can't sustain i don't feel that i can sustain it with just myself i guess is is the bottom line. I, I definitely think you could but you know you don't <laughs> right. want to do that but i do i think and i said that in the beginning too but like there is this sort of spirituality element to this and then sort of the self-discovery right and i think even though a lot of it is your own self-discovery about like you know parts of your own life and mm -hmm. but then i I wonder too, in terms of writing this, like you just said, your editor would say like, hey, how did you really feel about that? And I think this goes for fiction too, or anything you're writing, even when you're, you know, writing journalism too, you have to sort of make sure the point is, is getting across right. beyond just the sort of bare bones of it. Yeah. So I'm wondering if, you know, were there any major revelations about your own life that you found while you were writing it? Um, or were the, the pieces you sort of wrote about already kind of there or, or did you actually come to find new things through this exploration of, of this book? I realized about myself that um, in the sort of years I spent collecting bits of, and pieces of writing and stories and, 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 th and things that people would tell me together and then assembling them, um, I found that the little pieces of writing that I would kind of do around my family life, mm -hmm. around the water, or how I felt about my relationship with uh, my dad, or my yeah. parents breaking up, um, or my brother even, like, you know, he he's just a year older than I am, and we're very close, and we mm -hmm. grew up on the swim team together, and just mm -hmm. like that push-pull of like how we, um, you know, we were in the water together, and you know, yeah. he was like the best breaststroker and I wanted to be like him and, you know, and then teaching lessons about patience, like just these little windows. Mm -hmm. And I realized um, as I kind of wove them into the whole arc of the book that they were, um, you know, they told me that I, um, that those moments by water were so essential to my perception of myself as a part of my family and yeah. it was close and that um, even though no one else in my family swims anymore with any regularity that, mm -hmm. that those were so formative to me that they're a part of my own like origin story my own mythology and like I hold them really, they're like little postcards that I hold really close and mm -hmm. um, you know chose to show because I felt like they were important to show you know mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it was, it is interesting because I, I did learn that about myself and I learned mm -hmm. how I use swimming as a way to swim through like tough things in my life. Like I really feel that to be true. And the more that I thought about it, especially for that last section of the book on flow, which is a departure from like the more heavier reportage of the first totally. of the book. And I thought, like, is that weird to have this section be more ideasy, more philosophical, more poetic, because uh, turning mm -hmm. to the poets to tell these stories. Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized, like, a lot of people have said, like, that's their favorite part of the book. Like, they yeah, actually, absolutely. You know, like, it, it comes to all this, like, you know, you have all these great stories, and then you, you get to this meditative part, the spiritual part, this, like, philosophical part that actually ties it all together in a like a very fundamental way. And so mm -hmm. I feel very um, happy to hear it when I hear that because that was a lot, the hardest part of the book to write. That's so interesting. It's so funny as like a reader and then writer, but I love talking to other writers, like what was hard yeah. for you, what wasn't? Cause like to me, that part of the book, when I got there, I felt like that. Like I was getting to this like weird Nirvana almost of like, ah, this is, <laughs> you know, sort of what all of this means. Um, so like, I am curious about the actual sort of reported stuff of like what was the most fascinating to you that you learned I mean there's a lot in here and I definitely want to talk about Saddam Hussein's pool um <laughs> but, yeah all right but I love that part um and I'm probably going to say this wrong the Nihon Iho the Japanese yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. do you want to talk about that a little bit yeah. just because I love it and I think it's great awesome. and then I want to hear sort of what real thing you learned through all this that's like something that's so 
I mean, there's so many cool facts, but you have to have them. Okay. Yeah, I actually felt like um, Nihon Eho, okay, so uh, that's uh, basically the Japanese swimming martial art, for those of you who don't know. And it's, you know, like um, judo or kendo, it has like a hierarchy of like, you, you have a master, you study under a master, and you are um, basically like a like an apprentice for many years in the same school of swimming, and there's like different techniques, and you kind of move up. Not You don't get belts, but you get like... Um, swim caps. Yeah, well, I know you on you. You have they wear these. I googled stripes. it. Yeah, they're like, yeah, and it has like <laughs> like stripes or yeah. whatever. Um, you add one when you move up. It's so interesting. Yeah. But um, so these backstory is that these schools of swimming came up during the samurai feudal period in Japan, where different clans had to defend different parcels of land in different geographical, you know, like on the sea, on the yeah. lake, on the river, yeah. whatever, and that you then should. Um, you know, develop certain techniques for defense. So it's a, it is a martial art. It is mm -hmm. how you protect, um, you know, that that land from invaders. And so um, there would be, for example, um, you know, treading water, like with the, that egg beater technique, just like eye level, being able to then push yourself yeah. out of the water and shoot wow. arrows or like sword play. I mean, like they can do crazy shit. It's so then, cool. <laughs> I had never like, to me, like I had never even heard of this. And when I started reading that section of the book, I immediately closed it and I went to the computer and I was yes, like, I have to know everything about this. <laughs> like, what is this? So cool. Because there's great videos. Sports Japan has like an amazing segment that I just love so much. Um, that is like, so they have now um, every year this annual competition in Japan where a lot of the different uh, practitioners of Nihon Eho come and there's different... Um, events yeah. you know like swimming across the like coordinated swimming across like an maybe it's like a phalanx yeah, yeah. phalanx phalanx across the water and then or um you know treading water in a particular way shooting arrows you have to keep the arrows dry you have this um you know 60 pound or 25 crazy. pound armor anyway it's crazy, crazy. You it up you <laughs> need to see it it's really beautiful and extraordinary and you're yeah. like Wait, but what's so cool about it, it's not about speed. It's not how we and mm -hmm. much of the rest of the world understand swimming and competition as like a race, like it's always mm -hmm. speed mm -hmm. or it's endurance, but this is something else. So like to your question about like, what did I learn from this? Yeah. It was a very cool like shift in perspective of looking at swimming in this light of like, um, you know, so again, absent the, the martial aspect of it like yeah. of course many martial arts are now disciplines of like mind and body and like, sort of like what you teach yourself <clears throat> when you when you are practice practicing this and becoming more and more efficient and more elegant and more beautiful in the 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 movements right mm -hmm. so like i went to japan and participated in this class and so all of these masters were there and then their students and they would be doing these just beautiful strokes through the water and it was in the pool but that they would be not like speed swimming, not against the clock, but do yeah. like really perfecting like the, the motions of their arms to, and they, very beautiful. Like it's not, so I, I guess some of you won't be surprised if I say that like, you know, that motion of like synchronized swimming with the legs, the egg beater technique that keeps their upper body so still and can push them out of the water was described something like that in samurai okay. scrolls from hundreds of years ago. That's something that was known. Wow. So it's just so cool how all of these things, these threads kind of tie together. But what I loved um, being able to observe and then also to talk to the people afterwards was that they said, you know, we, you know, some of the people have been doing it for like since, you know, decades, like 60 wow. years. And they had come to this level and you actually can't become like the Hanshi level, the highest level, unless you've been practicing it for like 40 or 50 years. And that... <laughs> And that's because you have like, uh, you have, you have, enough time has passed, you're old enough that you understand that right. it's not about the hurry, it's about um, something else, it's about cultivating your mind and body and patience and all of this mm -hmm. stuff. And I just love that. And, and actually that took me straight into the flow section of the book because mm. it was about this like, not this, um, not having your brain be separate from your body. Right. So then it was sort of like, well, how does water do that for us? Um, it, now we know how it affects our brains and also our bodies and how mm -hmm. it 
calms us and how it we respond to it in a very um, visceral and mental level. I wonder then, you know, how your own swimming then, obviously all of our kind of sports and motion and movements that we do in our lives sort of evolve with time and age uh -huh. and space and creativity and all that. So then you're writing this book, you're coming to all of these very cool new conclusions yourself about, about yourself, about your own spirituality in terms of swimming itself. So has your swimming changed then and evolved? Yeah. How has it, and you know, from the beginning of this book to now and yeah. you know, all of that? I definitely, I mean, I think one of the reasons that I actually started, that I actually decided to write the book was that I realized after having my kids, so my kids are now seven and 10. Um, and after my um, younger son was born, I realized how much I needed to get in the water every morning, mm -hmm. like to basically like swim away from everything mm -hmm. <laughs> and then figure out when I was ready to swim back. You know, like literally and figuratively, I just was like, I need to get away from everything. Mm -hmm. And then also like as I'm swimming and getting away from everything, I'm coming closer to myself because, you know, trying to decide like where I am as a, as a human, as an individual, as a writer, as a parent, you know, mm -hmm. as like, you know, debating these things and, and swimming was a, was a, a way a means of like working through some of this stuff yeah and um and also at the same time of course then like my body felt very well like after a swim right so it's yeah. like two of these things of like psychological distance emotional yeah. distance and mm -hmm. then also like being in a place also when you're totally underwater right you're with your brain you're with yourself you're mm -hmm. not with anyone else. No one's talking to you. Mm -hmm. You're talking to you or mm -hmm. not, or you're counting laps. And so like before that, I did, never really thought about it much. I didn't mm -hmm. think about it. I would just get in and swim. Maybe I'd notice some, <clears throat> you know, cool stuff in the open water or I'd be counting laps or I'd be going faster and, and thinking about the number of laps or sing songs or whatever. But then um, in, the, in this, the writing of this book, I of course had to interrogate that for myself. Mm -hmm. And then I would be like, oh, I'm thinking about <laughs> this. I feel like this. What yeah. am I thinking about? <laughs> you know, and it was very funny mm -hmm. to like get in the water in the morning and think like, I need to figure out what to write mm -hmm. <laughs> in this section of the book. Mm -hmm. So I have to swim and see what happens. And so it was like reporting on myself, which was um, actually really, you know, it was really uh, useful, you know? Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you were writing a memoir, but just saying right maybe it's like made my head explode like it's kind of i do i think that's really interesting what you're saying too like um i i have a lot of sports injuries so i did crew in college and just like have this is why i can't really surf anymore i'm always in pain i have arthritis i had a hip surgery i still have a torn labor in my shoulder i know just like a million injuries so like water though is a a good thing but for for a while there i got into um yoga which i should probably get back to but i remember at the beginning you know, when you're learning something, you're so focused on sort of learning it. And then yeah. as you get better at something, you can sort of clear your head and, and go back to yourself while you're doing the sort of motion. And I think you could say that with any sort of um, movement. But I always find, especially in LA here, you know, there's people that are doing yoga and they're in there and they're just like cranking their bodies. And they're just like, I'm going to burn as many calories or like get fit. And you're just like, oh man, this is like the opposite of, of what... <laughs> this is you know and it's so funny to watch people do that and then there's some sort of self-discovery hopefully for people along the way of of this exact movement you're talking about i think that's the right. the ultimate flow right i mean literally that's the yeah. word sort of there you use but um i think that's really cool and and really interesting and i i love what you say about your head being underwater i was we were just talking before this and one of my like pod family people has a pool so when I first went in her pool, like a few weeks ago, and it was finally warm enough here, I, um, the first thing I did was just dunk my head under, and it's like the most comforting, mm -hmm. like, womb-like, weirdo yeah. experience for me, but like, that feeling of just being underwater is, I think, one of the most joyous mm -hmm. sounds, and it's like the sound of nothing, right? But it's, yeah. It's well, so it's weird. like a muffled, it's like the yeah. world gets muffled. And I think that I, I so seized on that um, yeah. transition point when I was writing the end of this book. And I was like, I need to, how do I, um, I want to 
it was so important to me to get it right, like to describe yeah. what is it like to submer submerge. Submerge, yeah. And so I would do it like a million times in different places and kind of like be like, all right, what's happening? Like, yeah. what, what is the sound? Yeah, what's the sound? The was sound of silence. Like, yeah. <laughs> what is the sound of silence? What's the sound yeah. of silence? <laughs> uh, or, you know, or what do you see? What's the light look like? I, I, I actually find um, the parsing of that. I, I really like to do that. Like, I like that kind of writing where mm -hmm. you're like, you're, you're really acutely attuned to um, what it is you're trying to describe. Yeah. And so you you make an expedition of um, going to find out, and then and then when you're in the moment, you're kind of like, you know, yeah, kind of running. Yeah, the the light is so real too, especially like ocean swimming or surfing. Yes. When you think you're about to die, and you you know if you've been in the ocean, and you've ever been in any kind of predicament, uh, you know that you go the wrong way a lot of the times, and all of a sudden you swim right to the bottom, and you're like, "Shit, that is the absolute <laughs> wrong way!" And then you have to go back up, and you're like, "Oh, I should just be still and let myself come." Well, yeah, and then like yeah. you, you start, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole process to that, but like that, that idea of like finding the sort of speck of light or whatever it is, yeah. and, and in a pool that sort of exists too, in a of course a different way, but that same feeling of how do I get to the light? Which of course is like, you know, I think for any book, especially what, what you're doing and even with creatures, right? That's like a perfect metaphor all the time. It's all this like ocean and sea stuff. But um, I do love pools. I think in my old age now, pools are the sort of safer place for me. Yeah. And you have to talk about Saddam Hussein's pool because okay. I'm sure everyone asks about this, but, and I feel like maybe I had heard of this some how so when I got to, to your piece I did the same thing I stopped reading and then I went right to, <laughs> to see the google images and like the whole thing right because you can you can yeah see it. well you mentioned it so that's how I knew that obviously but please but is, please tell was, us all the joy of Saddam Hussein's pool. Uh, oh, uh, well so the backstory of that is that Saddam Hussein and his two murderous sons apparently <laughs> love swimming <laughs> big fans pool and every single one of their like 80 plus compounds around Iraq, you know. <laughs> Actually, I saw uh, during the writing of this book, I think I saw when my husband was watching one night, there's a movie that's about um, one of the sons, um, I think it's Uday Hussein's like body double, you know, they had a lot of body doubles. Yeah. And um, so that like so that in case there were assassination attempts and there was um there was a movie it was a fictional fictionalized version of it about one of those body doubles and what i noted in in the like some of the crazy scenes was that they would like try to drown people in the pools like this oh. opulent, amazing pool oh. <laughs> and there would be like like crazy scenes of like because they were very violent and yeah very storied and and, and truthfully uh, I, again like based on, on fact I guess but but when I saw the pools in those scenes I thought all right I guess that's real that they really liked they liked swimming <laughs> and they did lots of like nefarious deeds in pools anyway that's a tangent but an interesting love one it. I, I love, love it <laughs> <laughs> but um so uh in the Republican palace which is one of their palaces that was in in the middle of Baghdad um where Saddam Hussein liked to entertain visiting heads of state that palace in 2008 was part of the green zone so um you know all of the u.s military was based there the foreign service um you know peace u.n peacekeepers translators mm -hmm. everybody was there and so um heavily fortified and the ca character um in this section of the book um coach jay jay taylor was a foreign service guy who um was posted in Baghdad, was um, tasked with restarting the Fulbright Cultural Exchange Program. Can you imagine doing that? Oh, I was. <laughs> yeah, like crazy. it seems so normal, you know, in normal times, like get a full, you know, offer Fulbright scholarships, come study cultural exchange. It's very peaceable and, yeah. you know, idealistic. And so they wanted to restart this program. But in the middle of this time, the two years he was there, like he's, you know, mortar shell, like his third day there, he like almost got blown up by uh, a shelling. And so all of these crazy things happening. And one of the things they were allowed to do was swim in this pool. So um, actually for the LA Times book club conversation, um, Jim Rainey, who is a reporter for the LA Times was my <laughs> wonderful conversation partner. He was the only person and the first person to tell me that he had gone swimming in Baghdad as a war correspondent. And he said, when so I you, yeah, book, yeah, he said, 
Wow. I tell you, it really was like wonderful <laughs> again, that pool. <laughs> when I was so freaked out from being, you know, in a combat zone, he, like, I really was, it was so great to hear him. I wanted to hear him talk about this because, yeah. he's, you know, even though I didn't get to swim in Saddam Hussein's pool, he said at this hotel that they all stayed at, that all the reporters stayed at, um, that there was this really beautiful pool. And at the end of the day, he would go and swim in this pool. So same thing, like all of these, wow. um, you know, everyone who worked, soldiers, every, he would go and swim and they would get to do this. And it was so weird because it's like this beautiful, like, as you can imagine, the Husseins were very, they wasted no money on like chandeliers and like triple level diving boards. Yeah, and yeah. He would swim and the beautiful tile. And he started giving, people would come up to him and, and um, ask him to teach him how to, swim how to swim do like they could tell that he knew what he was doing so like give me some pointers and he ended up started the swim club of like 250 300 people wow years yeah. everywhere from everywhere that's from wild Mexico, from lebanon from mexico <laughs> from the ukraine from um just everywhere and that uh, madagascar is like what you know egypt why don't you know mm -hmm. how to swim what what you know i, I was so curious like, what, what you unified these people mm -hmm. And um, a lot of it, of course, was like socioeconomic, like access and or that they had just always wanted to swim better. Mm -hmm. And so it's just this beautiful story and like super weird too. like, yeah, you know, in there of like um, what they were experiencing day in and day out. And then when they would get into the pool, they would have an hour or two hours where they just were normal. Uh, felt normal felt yeah. they go for a swim um that they were um uh what was i going to say about that uh, oh that 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 you were not distinguished by what you were wearing in a hierarchy at a place that was yeah hierarchical. yeah that was interesting and that was super important and that was um a relief i think for a lot of them so it was you you do talk about that socioeconomic stuff throughout uh, even, you know, obviously it's intended in even spots where it's not, but there's, uh, that's such an interesting thing about swimming, like quite literally, you know, you're in some sort of swimsuit and you're sort of stripped down in a way, right? And so there's this kind of equal playing field when in reality, pools are absolutely not yeah. an equal playing field at yeah. all. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. that? I think that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, in that section of the book, it's the community section, right? So it's about like, one part of it is, of course, about these people in Baghdad finding community. But also, I saw that as an opportunity then to talk about, like, why in this country, yeah, um, pools and pool access has always been so um, <clears throat> unequal, so much tied to our history of segregation, racism. And the crazy thing is that th that legacy is so, um, so strong today, like, yeah. in, just the like um, much lower numbers of um, especially black mm -hmm. um, swimming education, um, being able to find access to pools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, even like, you know, it's even if you have means, it's really hard to find someone to teach your kid how to swim. Absolutely. It's hard to find the time, it's hard to find the pool, pool yeah. time, it's hard to find like get the spots. Da, da, da. And so like, um, given all of those barriers, and even if you do know how to swim, actually, I've talked to um, a, an organization called Black Kids Swim. Their mission is to increase like bl black competitive swimming participation. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and it was started by um, this woman named Ebony, Ro Ebony Roseman, who, who, when her daughter started swimming competitively, um, she realized that you know when you would Google like black kids swimming, like just to kind of like look for like role models or like see who else is swimming, what stories are out there? Like it was always like black people can't swim or <sighs> black people do this and that. And so it's like, you're up against not only like mm -hmm. physical barriers, not physical barriers, sorry, um, like institutional barriers, but also mm -hmm. cultural stereotypes that mm -hmm. prevent you from um, really wanting to continue. Like when you see that or when you see that everyone else is white or when you see that you're the only you know, and I, I think, you know, having had that experience myself, like mm -hmm. with, you know, in, in, in swimming sometimes, like it feels like you don't feel welcome. Mm -hmm. And so when you don't feel welcome, you never, you don't want to do it, do it mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, why do you have to fight that fight? So it's like all of these layers of um, inequity <clears throat> and uh, obstacles. And so I learned a lot about that. I learned a lot about 
the sort of like quietly insidious ways that actually once you think about it are like really glaring you know yeah um and actually one of the things i've been thinking about lately is uh a lot of these public pools um are closed remain closed and yeah i've been talking to a lot of the people who run these pools and it's like they don't even know if they'll ever be able to reopen again even when the pandemic ends because like they can't afford to do it they can't it's like they're hemorrhaging money now and um running a municipal pool yeah you know, uh is usually like a loss leader anyway like i guess like you yeah. know the, the 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 city or the town does it because they want to give this to the community but mm -hmm. they don't make any money and often lose money and so like now when kids there's not enough people they can't open and then they like you know it's just like a constant like trajectory that makes me so sad because that's how i learned to swim yeah so there was a community pool that mm -hmm. i got to use and um i wouldn't have wouldn't have happened otherwise and, yeah you know, same I, like my life would be so different i would not have this gift i wouldn't yeah. be here talking to you about this yeah <laughs> yeah so i feel it very um viscerally and in my in my heart that i like feel like that has to change um and i and you know one of the things i think about is like universal student education time yes with schools and the way it is in other countries you know that's yeah it. it's interesting to your like what you just said how it's so glaring because um especially when i was reading the book and i got to the community section uh -huh. immediately i was like yeah this is a glaring problem like it's something i recognize as a white person and in di different ways too, like socioeconomically and things that, mm -hmm. that I, you know, immediately was like, oh yeah, this, of course, this is a problem, you know? And it, it feels like, like exactly what you're saying, um, like your city or your town or some sort of like public money gives this back. Yeah. And, and now like after everything that's literally happening right now, like with, you know, even with, with a lot of public things, I'm like, it's so interesting and scary to think like what's, what's coming back and yeah yeah what's not i don't know um i so uh yeah i i am like i think that this is such a moment where that we it, that is like such an opportunity for real change and then i also am terrified yeah. of like what yeah will actually be be you know possible to to yeah um, you know to make happen um is this a good time to kind of see if there are any questions? Yeah, let's click on this. Um, How do we do this? Q and A. Oh, let's see. There's some people in the chat. Okay, 41 degrees, six hours is unsurvivable. What was he wearing? Oh. Um, so Ed, you want to know what he was wearing? He was wearing a um, red flannel shirt and like blue work pants, and that's it. <laughs> he had a sweater, and then he ditched the sweater. And, and his it, shoes, you said, came he had, off. He had boots and ditch the boots but so. was built like a seal so thank god for him oh, we worked up what um, else is on okay oh like dancing that must have been about yes all the movement we were talking about oh yeah um, i'm like squinting sorry folks i don't have my glasses on tim duncan had the world record in the punch meter free when he's 13 that's amazing <gasps> what? <gasps> yes Oh my God, that's fantastic. No, no, about back stories. That's so interesting. I knew I loved him, Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, um, wait, we have a Q and A. I have to, can you click on it? I can't click yes. on it. Yes. Who, oh. what are you reading now in your own writing? What texts have inspired you? Ooh, that's good. Oh, I was going to ask that too. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just finished reading um, Colson Wayhead's oh. The Nickel Boys, which was just so devastating. Oh. Um, and I had been meaning to read. I read mostly fiction. So when I read for fun, I, I read I read a ton of books and most of it is fiction. And I think it's because I want to escape from my work. <laughs> so I would read like Chrissy's book for fun. You know, it's great. I love it. A real like non-depressing book. <laughs> oh my God. But it was, yeah, but I don't mind depressing books. Actually, my friends make fun of me because they're like, why are you reading that so depressing? And I said, but it's so beautiful and it's so good. <laughs> human condition you know like i um yeah i don't know uh what else what are you reading um what am i reading i just um i'm on well i just finished the compton cowboys have you heard oh, of it I it's really read. great read it actually so i read a lot of nonfiction because oh, it so takes me out of yeah you know, fiction so um yeah. but i'm on right now and i have it on my desk so i can show you i'm on the craziest leonora carrington kick she's like 
she's like an absurdist uh, painter and writer. Books. Yeah. And it's almost like weird poetry, fantasy stuff. It's just, I think same as you, I need to um, get out of my head sometimes and yeah. read something way outside yeah. of, you know, what I'm doing. Um, I, well, I want to ask you too, because we were talking about this before. So are you able to write right now? Like, what's your creative energy? Like, how are yeah. you, you know, that's, I think, really hard right now for any creative Yeah, um, I was not able to write anything in the first, like, two months of this time <laughs> this special period we're in um and I think part of that was tied to like you know freaking out about putting a book out into yeah. a world where no one was time. able to swim or yeah. do anything and then um and then also I think I was telling you that um my life changed when we brought our amazing babysitter Calvin back into our pod mm. and then we're able to carve out little spaces of time that where I could sustain a, a real thought for more than two minutes and that was mm -hmm. amazing mm -hmm. and also like just again like in the in the summer absence of like camps and all of the fun swimming things that the kids would be doing that they had like a fun friend like mm -hmm. they had their favorite person Calvin other than us they might <laughs> actually like Calvin more than they like us that's okay but, um, that you know that they were um happy too I think that was also like a load off my mind as a parent. yeah like what what am I depriving or not me personally but like the world is depriving every every child of right now but also you know one of the things i thought about and i don't know what your internal life as a child was but like when i was a kid i spent a lot of time at home we didn't go anywhere we did not like yeah. take vacations we were like drawing and painting and writing and doing all these like watching movies and like that like we had a very rich interior life in our home with our parents yeah. Especially my dad, who's a painter, and like we would watch movies like when we were really little, like totally inappropriate movies mm -hmm. until like 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of like, maybe this is the time that I need to be cultivating that like creative life for my children. I mean, they have yeah. that. I don't know. It is, I think, you know, obviously with technology too, it's a lot different. But yeah, I, I mean, I similar, right? I think partly it's probably why we write, but. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I grew up with a single mom and it was just yeah. me and her most of the time and I'm an only child. So yeah. I was always like drawing, painting, making, like, cause reading, that's what yeah. we have. Yeah. Reading. Like that's the, what else you had to fill all the time. By yeah. Doing. Yeah. I actually feel kind of fine in quarantine because yeah. I'm like, Oh yeah, this is, kind of like, <laughs> this is always nice. what I've been doing. And I already worked from home. So yeah. I'm just like, okay, nice. not so bad, but yeah, the creative, energy I feel like I I kind of ebb and flow on it but I I do think everything you're saying especially watching kids and having kids involved brings it's like a, a suck but also brings like a new energy yeah. to the whole thing where you're kind of seeing it through them where like they are picking up these new things like you're saying it's just it's kind of in a weird way there's like new creative things happening mm -hmm. in in like at the same time that I feel that sometimes they suck the life force out of me <laughs> that yeah I, yeah also in like very weird and surprising ways like give it back to me like yeah. eight million fold and yeah. so um like because their brains are weird and I remember being a kid and being like I was weird I was super weird I had weird thoughts Same. and so they say things to me and I say that again <laughs> and I kind of like work it around you know and I think some, you know oftentimes it cool. will become a story or something yeah an not idea. in a way necessarily that I expect but like they're cool like they're yeah. weird and cool and so that is some silver lining of like the time that we're spending together. Um, I see there's other, a couple of other questions. I have them now. I can ask them to you. Oh, okay. Like, I, they finally popped up for me. Um, are you working on a new book? I am working on a new book and I, it's a children's book. Talk about kids. Um, so it's a children's book called Sarah and the Big Wave. And it's about the first uh, woman to surf Mavericks. This ginormous surf break here in Northern California and her name is Sarah Gerhardt and it's about the day she meets her first big wave. Yeah. I cannot wait for that. Um, um, and art is being finalized now and I'm so <laughs> happy. Oh I can't wait it's so cool so cool. Um, a few people have asked too can you speak to the influence um, of other great books about swimming so you know the texts that have inspired you the swimming books and then what do you think the next great swimming book will be about? Whoa Wow. Yeah, that's a deep one. Oh, I don't know. Um, well, 
So I've, I've read lots of swimming books. I really love Leanne Chapton's Swimming Studies, right? So that was a book I w read when it first came out and was so, um, I thought it was so cool because she, she merged her art with her writing and then mm -hmm. also with her, of course, her, like it's a memoir of her experience being like an elite Canadian swimmer and like, mm -hmm. you know, Olympic trials, all that stuff. And um, I, I think what I love about some of the things I'm seeing around swimming is that they're, they're sort of like breaking the um, genre strictures yeah and sort of like punching out of like her book i think won like the maybe the national book award for um like oh god what was it like biography or autobiography or something oh, i'm also thinking of like bill finnegan's book um, oh, Barbarian Days, which won for like biography right for the pulitzer for biography wasn't that i thought that was uh, a bit strange because it's like it's not a biography it's yeah, yeah yeah a memoir it's right like a, i don't know it's such a good book though it's so, so good. Yeah. So yeah. like in terms of like water and, and swimming and, and the relationship with water, I think like those two books I love so much. Um, and uh, as to what it would look like the next great book, yeah. on swimming, I have no idea. What do you think of it? What do you like? What are the what are other books you've read on swimming that you really liked? Um, the Barbarian Days, I think, was kind of the well, it's not really about swimming. It's kind of it's water. water yeah yeah i think i feel like you can kind of lump them together but um i also read um which isn't is fiction but the sea the sea oh. by john bainfield um okay someone when i was i think it was my agent a million years ago now when i submitted creatures and she was like have you read the sea the sea and i was like mm -hmm. no and it's not you know necessarily about ocean but i think this idea of like the way we like exactly what we're saying the way you sort of connect to water it feels like a yeah swimming book also yeah, and i think that way too about like when i think about like swimming yeah it's not swimming. literally yeah. swimming but it's like the the draw to yeah um someone wants to know are you swimming now dolphin club or was that just for the book oh well the dolphin club has been still closed although open to on a very um restricted level now um i did i am swimming um in the bay still and i swim now from uh, keller cove here in the east bay um and um i've been talking to a lot of dolphins <laughs> they're like aquatic park is super like crowded now and so yeah they're, they're, like different places like keller cove keller cove like i will go to keller and it's like on a crappy windy day and i'm the only person there which used to be scary but not anymore wow. i know the conditions and it's just great so yeah. Um, yeah, what's the, yeah what's the water temperature up there right now oh right you know it had been like 60 61 and then it got really really cold oh okay like in the 50s it just felt very like strangely cold and then now it's back up again i think um, yeah we got i mean i'm in santa monica so again i'm in like a giant bay so it's always much warmer obviously in the yeah, bay yeah um but it was like weirdly warm early this year which uh -huh. I, I thought was weird right because it's yeah. always warmest, like for us at least, um, in like October. But I thought it got really warm quick, and then I did a little, little dip the other day, and it was like really cold again. I was like, okay. <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah, um, oh, here's yeah. a, here's a really good question. Um, where can an adult learn how to swim in their middle age if they're not comfortable in their ability? Mm -hmm. I that love that question. Good. That's a great question. Um, well, obviously these are weird times, right? There's not a lot of pools. I would normally say a pool with a great <laughs> teacher, yeah. um, but also like now I think, um, you know, if you, if you live near a pretty, uh, if you live near a, a, an, a, you know, open water, like a beach where, or a lake where the, there's enough shallow water to mm -hmm. calm water to like um, swim, swim in, um, you know, go with a teacher, go, you know, I think just always the thing is like, you have to go with a buddy. Yeah, you know? totally. And if Especially if you're going in the ocean. You're really, really learning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You need to have a buddy. Um, but also like, you know, normally I would say like masters, masters teams mm -hmm. welcome everyone of every level. And is that true? Oh, that's interesting to me. I didn't know that. They really do. I mean, huh. not like very, very, um, 
beginners. I don't know. It seemed to me that that question was from someone who wants to know, yeah. had swum, but maybe was not totally comfortable. I don't know. I might be misunderstanding, but like masters, like I think there are like at least my masters seem that depends. Like there's like all levels of swimmers. I didn't know that. That's interesting even to me because sometimes I'm like, eh, I don't know if I'm going to be like a fast pole swimmer anymore, but, but I'm you're like, in, you're in LA and I feel like the master's teams there are more intense. I don't know. Well, I, I, before everything was insane, I, um, was at the YMCA here uh-huh. and, um, honestly, it felt like really competitive in that pool. Like <laughs> I've had like a lot of injuries. Sometimes I just want to like, you know, stretch and move. And I'm like, these people are like legit. Cause a lot of them too are ocean swimmers, you know, and they're just, yeah. So I'm, I don't know, it's very intimidating to me and I'm a really good swimmer and I'm just like, what, who are these people? They're like this 90 year old man just like laughing <laughs> and I'm like, I suck at this. Like, he's just so. showing you, he's like, he's like, look at that youngster. I'm going to show her. I don't, yeah, I'm certainly the youngest person there. I actually did, um, after my hip surgery for crew, I did uh, water aerobics for a year and that, God, that was so long ago. That was when I was like, you know, in my early twenties. And so I loved it so much that I want to do it again. It was like me and all these ladies, we had like matching visors and like pool earrings and floats. And we like for three hours, like, you know, an hour for the class. And then we'd go out and get like lunch. And I was like, that was like such a special time. I love that story so much because I miss my, the, the, when I normally swim in the pool, it coincides with this water aerobics class. And I know all those women, I see them like four (laughs) days a week. And I'm like, huh, you know, and, and in this time we would like be in, um, you know, over the last like, like five, six years, we would see each other like every almost day. every day yeah. in the locker room, yeah. chatting, talking yeah. about grandkids, visiting whoever, and like their aches and pains and just yeah. like, always like just dispensing <laughs> wisdom. And I would just be like, you know, let it wash <laughs> over me. And I miss, I really miss them. Yeah. Actually, I wrote a piece about that and, um, uh and then the woman who teaches the water aerobics class and she said i'm reading this and i'm crying because oh this hour you know yeah I'm back but like that's the thing me. i think you forget you it's almost like during this time you didn't even know what you would miss do you know what i yeah. mean because yeah. you're so used to just so much and now I'm like, oh, I would go to like the coffee shop and I don't even drink coffee. I would go get like a <laughs> tea, which I could just, you know, make at home because it's hot water. Uh, but I would go there and I'm a big Disney person because I grew up right next to Disneyland. Yeah. And I would go to the, the coffee shop because the guy who worked there ha- was a Disney fan and had like Disney pins on his hat. And it was just like this really weird interaction I had, like, but it was almost every day. And if we just would sort of, it was a very short interaction too. We'd yeah. only talk about Disney for what, like two minutes. It grounded but, you though. Every yeah, but day. it was my thing. And I'm just like, where does he live? What happened to him? Like, I have, no. will I ever see him again? It's very weird times. It's weird times. You well, I'm, I'm really glad that there. you're hanging in there and you're able to get in the water. And um, yeah. this book is amazing. If you guys have not read it, you should absolutely get this book. Look at these, look it's, at these books. They're friends. You they are friends. They're, They're pretty books. together. Um, thank you so much, Chrissy, for being here with me. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Yeah. Hi, Bill. Hello. <laughs> thank thank you, Chrissy. Bill. Thank you, Powell's, for having yeah, us. Thank Everyone, you please so buy much. all of your books from Powell's and yes. uh, support this institution that Absolutely. we're so happy to have. So that's what I was going to say. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you both of you for a a wonderful hour. Thanks for everyone for joining us at Powell's for this event. And uh, please consider purchasing a copy of of Bonnie's book, Why We Swim, by visiting us at powells.com. And while you're there, please be sure to check out our lineup of other upcoming virtual events. And we look forward to seeing you at another one of our events soon. So Bonnie, Chrissy, thanks again. We're really grateful and and have a great night. Thank Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.